Ever wonder how Liverpool consistently finds those hidden gems and takes game-changing tactical decisions? Today, we're pulling back the curtain on Liverpool's groundbreaking data analytics team and how their revolutionary approach isn't just winning matches, but fundamentally changing the way we understand the beautiful game. Welcome to No Ball IQ. <laughs> Today, let's actually try to utilize some of that IQ to understand the physics, chemistry, and biology behind how Liverpool's data-driven approach has been paying dividends since 2016 onwards, which has been severely underappreciated over the years. So, let's dive into it. First, consider how football scouting worked not so long ago. It was all about intuition and experience. A veteran scout might spend years traveling, relying on gut feeling about a player's good touch or football brain. Liverpool still respects that art, but they've supercharged it with science. When Fenway Sports Group acquired Liverpool, they brought a moneyball mentality from baseball, using data to value what others overlook. At Anfield, that meant hiring some of the brightest minds in sports analytics. Enter Dr. Ian Graham, a physicist from Cambridge, and Michael Edwards. Together with a dedicated analytics crew, they moved Liverpool beyond basic stats like goals or assists. Instead, they cooked up proprietary metrics, secret formulas tailored to what Liverpool needed on the pitch. Think of stats that measure not just how much a player does, but how and how much it helps the team. One famous example is a metric called possession value, which Ian Graham developed. Rather than simply counting passes, it asks, do this player's passes actually help create goals? It turned out that some midfielders with sky-high pass completion rates, the guys who never lose the ball, were actually too safe. Their passes went sideways, contributing little to the attacks. Insights like that helped Liverpool avoid being fooled by pretty numbers that don't translate into wins. It's a perfect example of the data difference, looking past surface stats to see who really makes an impact. Liverpool's analysts built models to evaluate players worldwide, adjusting for the varying strengths of different leagues. Essentially, they could scout the world from the comfort of their own computer. If a striker scored 20 goals in Austria, their algorithms could estimate how that might translate in the Premier League. They crunched thousands of data points, shots, assists, defensive actions, you name it, to spot players who were undervalued or overlooked. Data spotted clues that a human scout might miss, like a fullback whose crossing creates tons of chances despite a low profile, or a forward who's brilliant at pressing defenders but isn't on any highlight reels. Of course, having all that data is only half the story. <laughs> How did Liverpool actually use it? The answer lies in a unique partnership between analytics and traditional scouting. The analysts might highlight a young winger with brilliant pressing stats, while the scouts counter with insights from watching him live. Things numbers can't capture, like his off-ball movement or attitude. It's a two-way street. Sometimes the analysts put an unlikely name on the radar, someone scouts wouldn't have considered. Other times, a scout's hunch about a player from a far-flung league is run through the algorithms for validation. Liverpool's leadership empowered both sides. Scouts trusted their instincts, but verified with data, and analysts backed up their numbers with real-world context. This collaborative culture meant no signing was left to bias or a single opinion. Decisions were consensus-based. Crucially, everyone kept the club's identity in mind. A player could be brilliant in general, but the key question was, does he fit us? If data and scouts ever disagreed, that just sparked more research and discussion rather than a one-sided call. In the end, a transfer target had to convince both the gut and the algorithm. Now, what exactly were they all looking for in a Liverpool player? To understand Liverpool's recruitment, you have to understand their playing style under Jurgen Klopp. His philosophy, gegenpressing, is all about high intensity. Win the ball back the second you lose it, outrun and outfight the opponent, and turn defense into attack at lightning speed. It's thrilling, it's exhausting, and it demands a particular type of player. Liverpool's data gurus, aka the data boys, knew this and baked it into their scouting models. They weren't hunting for generic talent, they were hunting for Liverpool talent. That means players with the engine to press for 90 minutes, the pace to burst forward on counterattacks, the smarts to read the game, and the mentality to handle the pressure at Anfield. Liverpool tracks pretty much everything. How far and fast players run, how off they sprint, all of it. 
Can a given fullback tear up and down the wing all game? Does a midfielder relentlessly cover every blade of grass? If a player only logs about 8 kilometers a match at a gentle jog, he probably wouldn't survive Klopp's regime, where most players easily exceed 10 kilometers with plenty of sprints. To pinpoint suitable athletes, the analyst looked at metrics like high intensity runs per 90 minutes or sprints in the final phase of a match, a good gauge of fitness. Then they layered on tactical stats, like how often does a forward press defenders? How many times does a winger win the ball back in the opponent's half? If a player hit Liverpool's benchmarks on these counts, he officially had the makings of a Liverpool player. And it wasn't only about physical and tactical ability. Mentality was a huge factor too. Klopp's Liverpool has been defined by team spirit and resilience. The club's scouts and analysts paid close attention to a player's character and background. Was he a hard worker? How did he cope with setbacks? In fact, Liverpool often found value in players who had experienced adversity or rejection. Look at some of their signings. Many came from smaller clubs or had even been relegated before. Rather than seeing that as a red flag, Liverpool saw a learning experience. A player like Andy Robertson, who went down with Hull City, or Ginny Wijnaldum, relegated with Newcastle, had tasted failure and fought back. That suggested a certain mental toughness. They wouldn't crumble when the weight of the Liverpool shirt and all its expectations fell on their shoulders. Let's talk about some real-world examples of this approach in action. The hits that, in hindsight, look like genius moves. Start with Mohamed Salah. When Liverpool signed Salah in 2017, some fans and pundits were skeptical. Weren't they getting a Chelsea reject who struggled in England before? But Liverpool's analysts saw what others didn't. Salah's numbers at AS Roma were off the charts. Not just his goal tally, but his underlying output. He was constantly getting into significant scoring positions and creating chances for teammates. <laughs> in plain terms, he was a chance-generating machine. The data team projected that in Liverpool's faster attack, Salah's speed and knack for finding dangerous spaces would translate into a flood of goals. They were absolutely right. Salah hit the ground sprinting, literally, and smashed the Premier League scoring record in his first season. And Liverpool applied similar insights when they signed Sadio Mane from Southampton a year earlier. He wasn't just quick and skillful, he was also one of the league's most relentless pressers of the ball, which made him a perfect fit for Klopp's high-octane front line. Now, consider Andrew Robertson. This signing shows Liverpool's eye for undervalued talent. Robertson had just been relegated with Hull City, not exactly where top clubs look for starters. But Liverpool isn't a typical top club. Their scouting and data team dug into Robertson's performances and saw a rough diamond. Despite Hull's struggles, Robertson's numbers popped. He covered huge distances up and down the left flank, whipped in lots of crosses, and busted a gut to track back on defense. In other words, he already played like a Liverpool fullback should. On top of that, Robertson had been rejected by Celtic as a teenager and clawed his way up from amateur football. The kind of hunger and resilience Liverpool wanted. They brought him in for a mere £8 million. He started as a backup, but before long, he blossomed into one of the best left-backs in the world. A bargain turned world beater. When Liverpool bought Diogo Jota from Wolves in 2020, some eyebrows raised at the fee for a player who wasn't a superstar. But the data boys told a different story. Jota was a menace in the box. He made tons of clever runs, often popping up unmarked at the back post. And his expected goals per 90 minutes were outstanding for someone who wasn't even an out-and-out -out striker. With better service around him at Liverpool, Jota was destined to score a lot. He also fit the pressing criteria, coming from a Wolves side that valued high-intensity work off the ball. Sure enough, once at Liverpool, he slotted in perfectly, scoring freely and even pushing some of Liverpool's established stars for their starting spots. But sadly, in 2025, we all know how he left every football fan in tears, including me, but let's not get into it today. Even when Liverpool spends big, it's calculated. Take Virgil van Dijk, who in 2018 became the world's most expensive defender. Liverpool scouts were already convinced from watching him boss the back line at Southampton, and the data backed it up too. Van Dijk won an overwhelming percentage of aerial duels, perfect to fix a weakness on set pieces. He could pass out from the back to ignite attacks, and he rarely missed games, meaning he was reliably fit. The club's hierarchy was confident he was the complete package for Klopp's system, a defender who could thrive with a high defensive line and significant responsibilities. They were so sure about him that when their first attempt to buy Van Dyke in 2017 fell through, they refused to settle for anyone else. They waited until they could get their man, even as outsiders panicked that Liverpool urgently needed a centre-back. <laughs> Patience paid off. Van Dyke arrived, immediately transformed the defence, 
and became the rock upon which a Champions League and a Premier League title were built. Arne Slot's appointment in 2024 initially left many fans and observers surprised. He was relatively unknown outside the Netherlands, despite transforming Feyenoord into champions. Some pundits, <laughs> Jamie Carragher, called Liverpool gambling on the next big thing, rather than a proven elite coach. Even so, Jurgen Klopp publicly endorsed Slot, helping win over skeptics. Once the season began, Slot quickly earned praise. Liverpool opened with three straight wins, including a 3-0 at Old Trafford and went on to win 10 of their first 11 league matches. This record-breaking start marked as strong a progress report as any for a Premier League newcomer. Fans were thrilled by the fast start, though a shock 1-0 home loss to Nottingham Forest reminded everyone it wouldn't be all smooth sailing, with supporters questioning Slot's substitutions and approach against defensive opponents. Slot's hiring and early success underscore Liverpool's famed data-driven culture. The club's research team, led by Dr. Will Spearman, used analytics to identify Slot as Klopp's ideal successor, seeking a coach with a similar high-pressing, fast-paced style and strong player development record. Since taking charge, Slot has embraced this data-centric approach. He works closely with Liverpool's analytics department to inform tactics and training, ensuring the club's ethos of evidence-based decision-making continues seamlessly from the Klopp era. These examples highlight a pattern. Liverpool often found talent in places others overlooked, such as mid-table teams, relegated teams, and lesser-known European leagues, and unlocked their full potential. The secret was exhaustive homework, breaking players down by the things that really matter for Liverpool's style, and understanding the context of each player's career. When both the data and the scout eyes said yes, Liverpool acted decisively. That's how they kept hitting the transfer bullseye again and again. <laughs> In training, players wear GPS trackers that log every step, sprint, and turn. Performance staff pour over this info to ensure no one's overworked. By tracking heart rates and recovery times, they tweak individual training loads. If data shows a player logging unusually high exertion, he might get a lighter session to stay fresh. If an explosive player's sprint numbers suddenly dip, it flags fatigue or a brewing injury, allowing staff to intervene early. This proactive, data-driven approach paid off. During Liverpool's peak title-winning seasons, the team suffered relatively few injuries to key players. It also helped them maintain that ferocious pressing style right into the 90th minute. You'd often see Liverpool still outrunning opponents late in games. It's not just passion. That's science, making sure the tank isn't empty when it matters. Analytics even sneak into match strategy. The coaches and analysts work together to fine-tune tactics using data. For example, if stats show an opponent is weak on their left side, Slot might encourage his right back to push higher than usual, knowing the player has the stamina and a data-backed advantage on that flank. Or if analysis reveals that a particular midfield trio consistently dominates games when they play together, Slot can trust that combination in a big match. In this way, data removes some of the guesswork from decisions, backing a manager's intuition with hard evidence. Liverpool's data-driven revolution has sent shockwaves through the football world. When you win the Champions League and Premier League, everyone takes notice. Suddenly, everyone wanted a piece of that moneyball magic. Clubs like Brentford and Brighton, smaller teams without Liverpool's budget, started using similar data-driven approaches to punch above their weight. Brighton has unearthed gems from far-flung places, like a standout from Ecuador or a winger from Japan, using methods much like Liverpool's. Even the big boys are catching on. Manchester City, despite its wealth, relies on data analysts and technology to gain an edge in recruitment and tactics. By now, practically every Premier League club has an analytics department. Though, not all have nailed the people data blend quite like Liverpool did. And football culture has shifted. A decade ago, terms like expected goals or pressing triggers were obscure. Now, you'll hear them on highlight shows and see them in match reports. Liverpool's success made it impossible to dismiss analytics as nerdy nonsense. <laughs> Clearly, those spreadsheets can deliver silverware. Ultimately, Liverpool's brilliance wasn't just down to a charismatic manager or wealthy owners. It came from building one of the smartest backrooms in world football. Picture a room where old school scouts rub shoulders with data scientists, where every transfer target is a puzzle solved with video, data, and debate, where nothing is left to chance if it could be measured. By finding value in unlikely places and sharpening tactics through analysis, they've inspired a generation of clubs to follow suit. 
The beautiful game, once governed by gut instinct and superstition, is becoming increasingly innovative and strategic. And a lot of that is thanks to the pioneers at Liverpool who dared to blend science with football. So, the next time you see Liverpool's new signing score a hat-trick or watch the team outrun opponents in the 90th minute, remember, it's not magic. It's the result of countless hours of analytical genius and scouting insight working in concert. This is the future of football. And Liverpool got there ahead of the pack. So that's a wrap from my end today. So please don't forget to subscribe. Remember, it's free for you, but priceless for me, all right? As it takes a lot of effort to craft these videos, I hope you will appreciate it. So people, bye for now.